This is the Investor Connect podcast program. This is Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show, in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, private equity, family offices, and many other investor groups for startups and growth companies. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for joining us. We're continuing the Shaping Funding and MedTech Insights from Industry Insiders webinar by Kuretsu Forum. In this segment, we talked about the advice for entrepreneurs and investors, and we asked the audience for their advice for entrepreneurs breaking into the medtech industry. We discussed what investors should look for in promising medtech startups in the current investment client. I hope you enjoy this episode. And so my next question for the guest today is, your advice for entrepreneurs and investors, what do you tell them to do before they go out to raise that funding or before they go out to make that investment? And let's start off with Paul. What's your advice to the those in this space for investing and funding or raising funding for startups? Yeah, I know it's you know as a angel investor, I tend to I, I follow if you guys remember Peter Lynch, and he was the original fund manager of Magellan, the Magellan Fund. And I read an article when I was a young man, and he said, "Go young man, Paul, just just go." <laughs> When the number begins with the six, you don't feel so <laughs> So, but, but he said, you know, invest in what you know. And so I, I have always taken that to heart. So typically when you look at my angel portfolio, ones that I'm writing checks to directly, they're usually in the medical device space. And so, you know, for me, it's, it, it, it's looking at, well, what's the, you know, where's the company now? What does the valuation look like? What is the regulatory path? What does the commercialization strategy look like? And, you know, how long, what does it take to get there, right? What does the, you know, execution look like to make that happen? And I think Brianna touched on this before about the different rounds of funding. You know, I've been in some deals, Brianna, that came out of the Pacific Northwest and don't take this in any offense. They weren't Howard Lubert term sheets where we didn't have participating preferred rights. And uh, we got crushed. When the VCs came in and put $40 million in, you know, we ended up getting squashed in the deal. And so those are, you know, you go through a couple of those and all of a sudden you start looking at, well, what are the terms look like? You know, how do we protect ourselves when those types of things in, inevitably or invariably will happen? And we have to come to terms with that as an angel investor. So how do we protect ourselves? That is part of the reason why I have chosen to be a member of Koretsu because it's it's sort of like you know the pack mentality, right? There's strength in numbers. I I can't negotiate the same kind of term sheet that that a group like Koretsu can if I'm just writing a you know it could be a, even if it was a six figure check. I'm not going to be able to negotiate any terms anywhere near. So those are things that I think as a as an angel investor you need to look look to. Um, the other is, as I said earlier, the regulatory path, right? So is it a 510 cable device? It's a very, cl very clear path. We know what it's going to take to get there. Or is it, you know, an ID PMA, which, you know, I, I think, I mean, those types of technologies are the ones that really change the industry, which really change clinical pathways and, and patient treatment opportunities. But at the same time, there's a lot more risk. So what's the... What is the, you know, what is the exit potential of those deals look like? How many funding rounds do you need to go through and, and so forth? So that, you know, this is me, Paul, the angel investor pontificating over, you know, the years of been being able to do this and looking at deals, not only as an individual, but also at Hatch, because we tend to, you know, on the incubator side of our business, we like 510 cable single use devices that, you know, don't have software that are very predictable. We know, you know, this is what it's going to take to get into the market. That's been my investment thesis. So hopefully that's helpful. Good advice. And, and Todd, what's your take on this? What do you tell people to do before they go out to do the fundraise or the investment? How many hours do we have? Just a few, but love Just to hear it. Just a few. So a couple of things. The first one is don't go out to raise money too soon. Understand your plan. Understand what you're doing. Picture yourself as an investor. And the way I pick companies today that I get involved with, I feel like I'm a VC or an investor because I have to decide what to invest my time in. So what attracted me 
to the business at first? And how do I put the piece parts together? Because you don't want to go out to investors too early because they do have long memories. I'm sure, Brianna, you remember every single company that's gone through, through screening. I remember how I felt. I exactly. <laughs> and, but, but that's the point. The point of this is, is don't go out too soon, but go out when you're credible. Where the team shines where they're looking at the team, they realize you have an A team and an A product. So you, if you go out too soon, those long memories, because they go back to the first email you sent, they go back to the second. The third is we as entrepreneurs, we tend to spam the world of investors thinking the more we spam them, the more we, they, they pay attention to us. Well, they actually do save those sometimes and look back and say, oh, you weren't investable then, you may not be investable now. Or if you pivot or change, you spend the next two sessions with them trying to explain why you changed. Don't go out too soon with an idea half-baked. Go out there with a supply chain, a regulatory strategy, a commercial strategy, a pricing. You talk to a few doctors. You talk to a few customers. At Solution, we're at 1,900 customers right now. And I think we have a good understanding of it, but it takes hundred or, or, or a lot to make sure you have understanding the market and have credibility. And then once you start going out to raise money, don't put a gun to your head because it will always take you longer than you expect to raise the money and keep the plans going. So be prepared. I'm not a big fan of the dog and pony shows that everybody goes through to raise $5,000, $10,000 here. I think they're, you're spending way too many time spinning your wheels when you should be doing something productive like go talk to customers, go talk to doctors, go talk to payers, and go talk to your supply chain. Have that in your hands. So don't go out too soon. Great advice. And Brianna, you're giving advice to startups and investors every day. What's, what's your current coaching in this time frame? Well, one, as I've been saying throughout today's talk, is planning. You've got a plan. you got to have multiple plans. So as a CEO, it's tough. It's lonely. It's tough. You have it's basically a two-sided marketplace. You're selling one product to one customer and you're selling another product to investors. And one mistake I see entrepreneurs make often is that they go to their attorney for advice or they go to their CPA for advice or they go to the service providers for advice. And I would encourage uh, to just bring up a different comment because I totally agree with what Todd said and what Paul said is... You've got to do your market research on what's actually going on in the investment market right now and where private investors are. Mm -hmm. And then build and then build that go-to-market strategy to sell your company off of that market research. And you need to care about your customers because your attorney doesn't care about us. And so as much as I they might think they do, it's up to, you know, I think the best use of time and money from an entrepreneur with their attorney is to spend it walking through the term sheet on how they're protected and how the investor is protected because these are long-term relationships that they're getting into and understanding what that is and knowing their customer. It is not, it is not easy times. The other thing I wanna piggyback off of that Paul said is that he spoke as Paul. I speak as Brianna. And unfortunately, if you talk to one investor, you've talked to one investor. <laughs> and so not all investors are created equal. Everybody has their own MO and how they operate. Everybody wants something different in the deck. Everybody wants to see some sort of different statistic that makes them go. And you've got to figure out what that is to be able to really bring them in because people invest in people they know and trust. And there is a difference from East Coast to West Coast, from the Midwest to the Southeast. Like there is differences in culture amongst, I mean, Silicon Valley, I felt like I was walking through an episode of Silicon Valley for the three days I was there. I just could not figure out what was going on. It was just like, I can't handle <laughs> all of this. Like, am I on TV right now? Because this seems like it was all scripted. So, you know, it's, it's understanding that it doesn't matter if you're going for funding from an accelerator, from a private investor, from a VC, from a strategic grant writing for non-dilutive funding, whatever it is, it's all hard. It's all hard all and hard. it takes work and there's just no shortcuts. So do your research and build a plan. 
and people right. invest in people they know and trust. That's it. Right. Dr. Atkog, what's your take there? What are you, what's your advice for entrepreneurs and investors? So uh, definitely with that, and I'll echo a bunch of what my colleagues have already said, but I, I spend, as I mentioned, I end up spending a lot of time talking to entrepreneurs. I'm talking really at the, at the earliest stages and particularly physician entrepreneurs. And a couple of things that, that are common themes. One of them is, you know, make sure you have something real. I mean, a lot of physicians will like, you know, it's more like a science project. They're like, hey, it's just really cool. They're like, well, what's the product? You know, is that, and what is, the, is there a commercial value? So you should, you, you know, you need to know right from the beginning that this is going to improve care in some way. Is it going to be less invasive? Is it going to decrease complications? Is it going to be more cost-effective? Is it going to save the physician? Whatever. There has to be something real. And err on the side of, you know, I, I know like Ron said, you, know, you don't want to sort of overdo the adjectives, but the adjectives should reflect what, you, you know, this should be something worthwhile. This should be something that has an opportunity to have a, that's not just the me too, you know, product that has some opportunity to have a meaningful impact and address some meaningful unmet need on the clinical side. And the other lesson, besides that these are commercial op entities, not just science projects, is you can do most of the risk. And this is, I think, echoes some of Paul's. This is an exercise ultimately in serial de-risking, right? I think that that word already came up. You know, you're starting off with something that's super high risk and you work your way and hopefully you'll get it to a point where it's low enough, where it's been de-risked sufficiently that somebody else wants to take it over. But most of that risk analysis you can actually do before raising much at all, or maybe just a bit from your, you know, 401k or, you know, to, to do so, to get a few, a few consultants, you know, what's the technology risk? What's the IP risk? You know, under technology, what's the IP risk? Is it feasible? Can you just do, you know, some early stage feasibility? Mm -hmm. Can you actually manufacture this thing? You can do that analysis, you know, before spending two years kind of playing around in feasibility in the lab. We, when we did Vortex Medical, I'll never forget this. It was sort of, I'm sure, a bit of a fluke. And I, I don't think it's apocryphal. I think it's actually how it happened, where we we had a device that had a cannula and we had to figure out a way for the, to make a funnel at the end of it. And instead of going through just the usual kind of incremental thing, we brought everybody in the room together. We had the night and all people, the balloon people, the cannula people. They were all in one room at one of the contract manufacturers. And we just sat down the whole day and couldn't quite figure it out. And over lunch, I kind of scrapped, literally crawled something on a napkin and we came back and we sort of figured it out. And by the end of the day, we had the actual design and, and everybody was able to sign off. Do you think you can make that? Can you extrude that, that, that cannula? How are you going to attach the balloon to it? Kind of went through the room and effectively that was it. That was what that, that ended up being the, being the design. So, you know, so all of the, you know, the tech, I won't go through all of the technology risk, the clinical risk, talk to physicians, understand what the clinical scenario, what is the hurdle going to be? What's the hurdle going to be on the commercial side? You can talk about you know sales and marketing plans and commercial plans before you've even you mm -hmm. know done a damn thing and and mm -hmm. and you know think through what what are the costs of goods going to be what is the ASD going to be and what's the margin if the margin is not a number that's greater than eight the first digit is greater than eight then then find something else because they're, they're, it's just not going to as cool as it is and as much passion as you might have about the underlying science or the other technology it may it's probably not going to be commercially viable. And then the other one for the entrepreneurs with this kind of the shiny object thing, you know, this is all of these steps are a step towards the final path. Don't get too enamored by the trappings of, oh, wow, I'm a CEO now. I've got a company. I've got a, you know, I have an LLC with, you know, what's the name? What should the name be? What should the logo be? What should the, you know, I've seen some people, they already have an animation and they haven't done anything. They've just, they've spent, you know, 40 grand on an animation without actually having done anything. Mm -hmm. And so are people who've actually hired People, I have a commercial person on my team. Well, you know, you're three years away from, you know, from, from having, so there's definitely some of the trappings and some of the shiny object stuff that, that people just need to be focused on. I only have one, one thought with regard to, I don't advise investors very much, but I think one of the things that I, that I see is a bit of the herd mentality, right? So like everybody gets on this particular bandwagon, either based on the particular, you know, what's the hot thing? Again, AI, ML, you know, blockchain, whatever it happens to be. And I think the real opportunities, the real, the real nuggets, the real diamonds in the rough are things that go, frankly, are often contrarian and go against the, 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 the herd. And, the, and the, the part of the herd mentality also follows with people. Yes, you invest in people, but just because someone was a serial entrepreneur doesn't mean that their next mm -hmm. thing is going to be the hot thing, right? I mean, and I, and I find that there's a little bit of that. Like, you know, somebody's had, look, to their credit, they had some nice exit, whatever, but then 
you know, they latch on to some technology that just doesn't, you know, if you look at, if you take away who's actually involved and you actually look at it, you're like, oh, that, that doesn't sound so hot. But then because it has a name of somebody who's a serial CEO, it sort of adds, adds some cachet to that. So that's, that's something I would just encourage people to keep an eye out for, you know, to be contrarian, to look at the technology, to be a little bit more wary of just, you know, what's so-and-so's next project. Great. And again, for those in the audience, if you have a question, please post it now. The first question I like to pose to the panel is on the topic of convergence. I've seen a number of investors now come in with the investment thesis that they want to invest at the intersection of technology and medical device or biotech. And what do you think the impact is on raising funding and taking a market through a product through the market? For example, it used to be you had to raise money for everything because your biotech was on a FDA path and you couldn't sell anything. Well, now many people are actually using AI to create drug discovery engines and then selling the data to other groups as they go through. Now they have a revenue stream that can actually fuel their growth in addition to just raising money or grants. And what's your take on, will that give us some new business models and new go-to-market strategies for the biotech and medtech med tech companies? Or do you think we'll always be just raising funding up front? I'll leave it open. Who, who in the group would like to go first on that? I'd like to go because this goes along with my thought about AI and machine learning. Let's say you have a, di a, a therapeutic area that you like. One of the AI things that you can do very quickly is search through clinical trials, search through molecules that have failed. And there are quite a few companies doing business models of, of this, looking at how can I repurpose failed drugs, older drugs, start to either one, license them out from day one or license them out after phase one, phase two, then wash, rinse, repeat. So those models are out there from a drug perspective. And now from the device and the, and the drug intersection where I live right now, one of the things that I do is I have a platform drug, a drug delivery and I'm a drug company. I go through, my device actually has to go through Cedar and the combination drug device. But what I can do now is, is that platform, I can license out to other companies who want to give patient self-administration, removing refrigeration, making their drugs stable, and use that as a license vehicle to grow my commercial and drug business. So what you're starting to see now is, is that combination of does your device have a platform that can enable other people at the same time as enable yours and use that to fundraise? The challenge to that is on my device side, they want to know that I'm GMP ready, that I'm getting to market. So I have to leverage the, and balance the, the scales on what's going to be a license and what, I'm, what am I going to do and what am I going to fund? And then when do I license out? So they're very strong models, and the AI model changes the drug development to someone smart with an indication, finds a repurposed drugs, go licenses it, or tries to contract with a pharma and say, hey, I have this success rate from this company. Let me look at your portfolio and go there, and then use that to generate their own drugs moving forward. Very viable models, but very complex. Right. Anyone else want to add on to that? I think what, what do you, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think what, what, you know, what you're doing is amazing and being at the intersection between a convergence between two typically siloed uh, sectors is great. They're not a ton of opportunities, but one thing I would say is that, you know, look, we're, MedTech is a bit of an ugly duckling in the life sciences space, yeah. right? And, um, the, the speculative money still is, is much, is, it flows much greater in, in the biotech side of things. And so, so if there's an opportunity to kind of link the two, you know, if you can do something, so, you know, there's a CAR-T drug that costs a million dollars per patient. If there's a med, med device that can facilitate that in some way, you know, then the economics of that are going to be greater. Our, you know, I mentioned our digital health company, Veris, you know, we have an implantable monitor device. It's a, you know, absolutely, you know, no different. It's linked to, a, to, the, to the insertion of an implantable port. But it's just basically an implantable cardiac monitor. So there's a med tech version of that. But one of the things that we're looking at to combine this is to work with biotech companies to do monitoring during their clinical trials, or even more importantly, after, after their approval in the post-market surveillance side of things. So similar thing, you know, very expensive drug. The difference between being third line and second line and first line is a huge amount. There's a lot of value to be created 
at those intersections. My point is that they're not always, they're not just sort of there ready for the taking. You have to go find them and they're not, they're, they're, I, I wouldn't say there's a ton of that right now, but if you can find it, you can leverage some of the, 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 the sort of premium that's placed uh, in that, in that sector. Right. The only, yeah. Quickly, Nicole? I would just like to. I quickly, I just like to add. I I think I like more streams of revenue. I think more streams of revenue. You know, if you're able to to grow that and be able to reinvest in the business and raise less capital and be more capital efficient, it's great. In terms of a fundraising strategy and doing it from that standpoint, I pause a bit when I look at presentations. I want to see what my funding dollars is going towards and the go to market and the regulatory and all of that and what the funding is actually and staying focused on that. And if there's things that can, those bright and shiny objects that we were talking about earlier, if we get distracted by that, is that going to take away from the core of what it is? So absolutely, that, that gives me a little right. pause. Cool. Yeah, the only oh. that I was going to make is just, you know, from the device side, you know, you look at these combination products, and, you know, or, I mean, the ones that are, you know, the drug eluding stents or the drug coated balloons now, you know, the regulatory path to not only get into market, but then show that there's clinical benefit, just the sheer dollars that are required to get behind that, you know, make it out of reach for many companies, right? And so th there was a company that came through Koretsu Forums years back that had a delivery mechanism for paclitaxel or could be, you know, any other drug that could have been, and, and the pathway to, for the device was very straightforward, right? It's a the device, it can deliver uh, an agent of some sort, but to get reimbursement, to get, uptake in the market, you know, they had to show it, it's use with a specific drug, it's, you know, specific benefit. And it became, it became insurmountable. They couldn't raise the capital. And it's sad because that was, I think, a very viable technology that has a real, had a real place. But so I think, you know, you, I, I my advice to entrepreneurs is just very you got to think very carefully when you're talking about combo products because you're you're opening up a whole you know another world and you know yeah uh, yeah exactly a man who had a right you know at one point yeah I no I we we shy away from those I mean as interesting as they might be from an investment standpoint they're also a lot less predictable and. Uh, a lot more, a lot more find it. That's a good point, Paul. Well, great. I want to thank everybody. We're at the end of our time now. I want to thank Paul Janeski, Dr. Lee Sean Acklog, Todd Wallach, and Brianna McDonald for joining us today. And with that, I want to go ahead and wrap it up. I want to thank all of the questions that came in. And for those who want to stay abreast of the action that we are bringing here today with you, we encourage you to become a member of the Koretsu Forum. If interested in learning more, please email us at info at koretsuforum.net, info at koretsuforum.net. And we'll be dropping these links in the chat box for you to pick up there as well. And we'll send the recording to those who request it. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up today. We want to thank everybody for a great presentation and we'll close it for now. Thanks, Hall. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you, everyone. This is great. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at InvestorConnect.org. Paul T. Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions.